Are you risk credit worthy? Just one of the three behavior motivators we're going to take a look at in this video. It's been about 10 months since the pandemic started. And there's been a lot of changes. In fact, people's behaviors are becoming new habits. And those habits at scale are becoming trends. I think there's three key things going on here in terms of behavior motivators that I want to take a look at. One of them is risk credits, but the other two are touch economics and craving comfort. So let's dig in. I heard this notion of risk credits the other day. Somebody, as in, I don't know if taking transit is really worthy of the risk as a risk credit. And I started you know, thinking about the concept, what's really behind it? And it's, and it's this notion of fear and making decisions based around a trade-off for something and around this whole notion of, of being afraid and fear. And I put it out to my e-newsletter group. Folks made comments back saying, oh, for sure, you know, we are you know, definitely changing our behaviors based around you know, decisions we're making you know, for, the, for the sake of you know, um, the health of, a, of an aging parent or family member. Some people have left previous work in teaching and in the health profession simply because they see it as, as too risky, or they're even changing their, their, um, their activity levels in terms of sport, uh, going to less risky activities for fear that they might just have some crazy, you know, little accident or injury, and they don't want to end up in a hospital for something minor in the middle of a pandemic. So really interesting things that are we're fundamentally changing. And of course, we all we know, you know change, people are changing their, their habits around, you know, working at home, uh, group fitness, all these things. Um, and, and they're all being fundamentally governed around risk and risk credits. And I think this is a really big concept for us to understand as, you know, whenever we kind of merge back into the new normal, whatever that is, you know, we have to understand that consumers are going to be different. And a lot of this kind of fear may well continue on. So some questions we might want to ask, because, you know, their, their demographics and geographics will remain the same, but the psychographic and behavioral may well have changed and stay the same. So some questions that we might want to ask, you know, uh, has there been a shift in their values? And if yes, what? Has there been a shift in that value that will affect how you communicate with them? Kind of where, when, how, you know, what, and at what frequency? And has there been a shift in their buying behavior? Again, and in what way? And how might that shift kind of drive their behavior and impact of what you sell? Again, around frequency, around what you sell, when, where, and why. So, you know, there's some opportunity and insight in this, I think, the whole, you know, taking a look at understanding the entire customer journey, and it's a good place to start, reframing it from every interaction uh, possible from the position of fear. Um, if that sounds negative, it's not really meant to be. Really what you're searching for is you know, how can you make your interactions more safe and comforting uh, compared to their alternatives and how best to communicate that. And of course, health and economic fear are kind of two big buckets, uh, but there's also other fears at play. There's the fear of missing out, fear of being alone, fear of not moving forward or accomplishing things that you're wanting to accomplish or fear of living with regret. So I think this whole notion of risk credits is kind of a big thing that we need to kind of take a look at from a consumer perspective. There's also something here that I think we should look at in terms of touch economics. You know, as humans, we crave contact and connection, but right now there's been a huge absence of touch. You know, some people haven't hugged an elderly parent for close to 10 months. We haven't embraced close friends and relatives. And there's no high fives, there's no handshakes at business appointments. And, you know, in a commerce world, we've got the no touch payments, you know, online uh, delivery, uh, we're bypassing all these ta tactile things. And I think, you know, in marketing, it's all about meeting unmet or underserved needs. And I think, as we move forward, there's going to be a whole craving for touch, uh, and that will have a huge economic value in the future. So what might be some opportunity in that? 
where certainly the whole uh, area of reuniting and celebrating and you know whatever that might look like as we move forward here anything with a hug <laughs> at the end of the customer journey i think is going to be hugely motivating and there's also going to be i think a, a revival of you know products services and experiences around touch taste and smell anything that we've been de denied through an on-screen experience the third thing I think we need to take a look at in terms of kind of changed motivators around behaviors is this whole notion of craving comfort. You know, we've found comfort in, in many things since March, you know, our sweatpants, our, uh, you know, our slippers, our duvets, our hanging out with Netflix, uh, you know, Zoom calls with, you know, professional laptop and kind of party on the bottom do-it-yourself projects, you, you name it, board games. Lots of things have kind of brought comfort uh, in, since the uh, pandemic start, started. But it's, um, I think there's this craving of comfort is on a bigger scale is kind of a defense mechanism against the pandemic and, and bigger threats. And you know, some of those, those other threats are things around unease, around divisive politics and environmental concerns. And like, there's, there's just huge, other things going on in addition to the pandemic. And to a certain extent, consumers are kind of feeling a bit helpless in, in, the, in the midst of all of this. And so it kind of pushes us, us back into wanting comfort or, or things from more simpler times. And um, kind of anything that, that conjures up those memories can be seen as kind of part of that whole comfort marketing. So opportunity in that might be things around nostalgia, you know, things that's likely to emerge as, 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 a, as a concept here is nostalgia marketing. Uh, simplicity, security, sense of normalcy in some way will have appeal. It could be a nostalgia items, anything, you know, like rotary dial phones, turntables, LPs, you know, flip phones, um, film cameras, board games, you know, all those things are things that kind of conjure up this whole kind of nostalgia. And you know, or it could also involve, you know, past fad items, you know, things around hula hoops, Rubik's cubes, <laughs> pet rocks, right? Uh, you know, comfort marketing is apt to be with us with for some time, just because, you know, it kind of, as we try to kind of collectively heal from all of this, uh, this stuff, the whole notion of comfort in the past and simpler times, I think is, is a big piece. So comfort marketing, touch economics, and the big one, risk credits. Those are some key behavior motivators that I think we need to be aware of right now. Thanks for being here. Mary Charles and 5-Minute Marketing. We'll see you next time.